Welcome to the Evidence Reasons Academy, a sister channel to the Evidence and Reasons for the Christian Faith website and channel. Here at the Evidence Reasons Academy, we focus on learning math, physics, chemistry, and biology with the expectation that individuals with an open mind, after sufficient mastery of these topics, will be able to see that actual experiments and well-established principles of chemistry physics, cell biology, and probability theory are actually in conflict with the claims of abiogenesis theory and or evolutionary theory. And thus, through this process of learning basic science, if one has an open mind, one can see that although the world is cursed and full of troubles, the world is also intelligently designed by a creator. Jesus said, in which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. In the 21st century, the meaning of those words by our Lord and Savior takes on a new significance. As we move forward in our understanding of molecular and cell biology, we see more and more the wisdom knowledge, and majesty of our Creator. Greetings, I'm Salvador Cordova, and welcome to this first lecture of the College Level Molecular Biology Lecture Series presented by the Evidence Reasons Academy. This lecture series is based on a college level molecular biology course taught by Associate Professor of Molecular Biology, Change Laura Tan at the University of Missouri. I have the privilege of working with my distinguished colleague, Dr. Tan, to adapt and present this lecture series into the public domain. Dr. Tan is an Ivy League trained scientist and Harvard Medical School postdoctoral fellow. Her decision to become a professor of molecular biology was by the encouragement of Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, George Smith, who is also from the University of Missouri and Harvard. And perhaps ironically then, this encouragement by Dr. George Smith started Dr. Tan on her journey into intelligent design and creationism. I have adapted Dr. Tan's original college lecture series for the public consumption on the internet. This public version will also be somewhat a companion to a soon to be released and freely available molecularly, uh, I'm sorry, molecular biology textbook by Dr. Tan. Learning objectives for lecture one. Learn that the goal of this series of lectures on molecular biology is to understand life by building it, not literally building it, but conceptualizing what it takes to build life. Learn the central dogma of molecular biology. So those are, those are just the two items today. It's gonna to be a pretty light lecture. So what is molecular biology? <clears throat> It is the study of life at the molecular level, i.e. genes and their activities. But this leads to the question, what is life? Uh, that can be treated as a rhetorical question, but before directly addressing it, consider Virchow's cell theory. Uh, the Latin version is omnis cellula e cellula which translated means all cells arise from pre-existing cells. All cells arise from pre-existing cells. A slightly more modern version of this can be found in the biochemistry textbook by McKee and McKee, which states the theory as cells arise only from the division of exi existing cells. Cells arise only from the division of existing cells. And another textbook defines cell theory as the cell is the fundamental unit of structure and function in living things. All organisms 
are made up of one or more cells. Cells arise from other cells through cellular division. And uh, this is from Biology Libre text, uh, freely available in the public domain. Now look carefully that they define, they implicitly define something living as being made of a cell. The cell is the fundamental unit of structure and function in living things. One might therefore extrapolate this and say something is not considered living if it does not have cells. So this is my, this is Sal's informal definition of life. Life is that which is made of cells. Life is that which is made of cells. This conflicts with NASA's definition of life, which I don't like at all. Uh, NASA's definition is life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. The problem with this definition of life is that it will include just trivial, relatively trivial autocatalytic uh, man-made self-replicating systems that don't resemble cellular life at all. And molecular biology focuses on cellular life. So I don't use that definition in this lecture series, but I just simply pointed out to, to show that there are other definitions of the life of life than the one used in this lecture series. So again, so I might say cellular life, just to emphasize the fact of cellular life. Cellular life is that which is made of cells. And back again to the cell theory definition of cellular life. This is a picture of Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize winner in physics. He's ranked uh, seventh in, in the list of all time physicists. Now this, uh, how this, I just shifted gears here a little bit um, and I'll explain why. Uh, he's famous for the quote, among many other quotes. He said, here I stand, atoms with consciousness, matter with curiosity, a universe of atoms and atoms in the universe. And you can find how they did the ranking here that they listed him as number seven. But the real reason that uh, we post this here is another quote. He said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. What I cannot create, I do not understand. And that was written on his blackboard at the time of his death. Now, the reason this, how this relates to this lecture series is that Craig Ventner claimed uh, and he described, supposedly described the first replicating species we've had on the planet whose parent is a computer. Now, I'm going to challenge that I'm going to challenge that claim and say that that's just mostly hype. He did do something, but he certainly didn't um, create a, a, a cell from scratch whose parent was a computer. That's, um, that's really stretching it. Um, in any case, what he did do is when he created this cell by taking pre-existing, by taking pre-existing parts in that cell that he built, he, encoded in the DNA using uh, some sort of code, the words, what I cannot build, I do not understand. He wrote, what I cannot build, I do not understand, which is a variation of Feynman's quote. Here is Craig Ventner with President Bill Clinton. Um, <clears throat> and uh, by the way, uh, Ventner is, was the was the president of Celera Genomics Corporation, and he was uh, present there also with Francis Collins, chairman of the Human Genome Project at the National Institutes of Health, at uh, this White House meeting to announce that the two groups uh, of scientists have nearly completed mapping the human genetic code. Uh, Ventner was listed on Time Magazine's 2007 and 2008 100 list of the most influential people in the world. Uh, Ventner's effort won him renown as he and his team at Celera Corporation shared credit for sequencing the first draft human genome uh, with the publicly funded Human Genome Project. Uh, let me clarify that a little bit. There are actually two efforts, one public and one private. Craig Ventner headed up the private venture, which is amazing. 
So that picture is of the younger Craig Ventner with President Clinton. So understanding life via building it. And again, that's the theme of um, what I cannot build, I, I do not understand, or what I cannot create, I, I do not understand. So understanding life by building it. Building uh, this class will be, uh, this lecture series will be divided into two halves. Uh, the first half being building a self-replicating bacterial cell, and the second half building a self-replicating eukaryotic cell. Building a self-replicating bacterial cell will be explored by studying Ventner's work described here in this uh, paper creation of a bacterial cell controlled by a chemically synthesized genome. So we'll cover that in more detail throughout this series. There is a TED talk uh, called uh, Synthetic Life, and uh, I encourage the viewers to watch it to, to hear uh, Craig Ventner's take on his own work. In any case, the main goals of the lecture series We'll study, what is a gene? How can a gene be recognized as a gene? How can a gene be transcribed and translated at the right time, right place, and right levels? What is a genome? How can it be recognized as a genome? How can a genome be replicated and maintained? How do different organisms deal with the above questions? What is life? Molecularity? We can list the characteristics of life, self-replication, metabolism, growth, and death, etc. And I did mention, if we're talking about cellular life, there are certain characteristics of cellular life. The building blocks of life, molecules, hardware of life. We have large molecules and small molecules. Uh, large molecules include DNA, RNA, proteins, and small molecules, lipids, water, ions. Uh, fatty acids, for example, are a lipid. I will point out there are other classifications of large molecules, such as from uh, Molecular Biology 4th edition. Their classification is uh, proteins, DNA, RNA, and polysaccharides the small molecules being water, ion, fatty acids, and fatty acids or lipids. I have seen some that like to put lipids in the class of macromolecules, but um, that's neither here nor there. That's not the focus of this lecture series, but I just mentioned that in passing. So if we're gonna study molecular biology, it would definitely be important to understand the central dogma of molecular biology. And this is one statement of it in 1958. And I'll just read it. The central dogma, this states that once information is passed into protein, it cannot get out again. In more detail, the transfer of information from nucleic acid to nucleic acid or from nucleic acid to protein may be possible. The transfer from protein to protein or from protein to nucleic acid is impossible. Information here means the precise, the precise determination of sequence, either of bases in the nucleic acid or of amino acid residues in the protein. <clears throat> now, the 1970 version by Crick is more succinct. It says, the central dogma of molecular biology deals with the detailed residue by residue transfer of sequential information. It states that information cannot be transferred back from protein to either protein or nucleic acid. I should mention that Crick's, uh, uh, Crick's partner, James Watson, who shared the Nobel Prize with uh, Crick for the structure, discovery of structure of DNA, James Watson gave a different, slightly different version of the cell uh, central dogma. It's popular, but is incorrect. 
this is the simplistic DNA uh, leads to RNA, leads to proteins pathway. And that was in his, uh, in the first edition of the molecular biology of the gene, 1965. Watson's version differs from Crick because Watson describes a two-step DNA to RNA and RNA to protein process as the central dogma. One can look up the discussion of this difference in Larry Moran's blog, and there is the link there for those interested. Larry Moran personally likes this version of the central dogma by Lewin. It says, the central dogma states that information in nucleic acid can be perpetuated or transferred, but the transfer of information into protein is irreversible. I'll read it again. The central dogma states that information in nucleic acid can be perpetuated or transferred, but the transfer of information into protein is irreversible. So uh, apologies if you're not already confused enough because this is supposed to be the central dogma of molecular biology and there are varying definitions. Perhaps one way to visualize it, if one can recapitulate this diagram, I think one will get the essentials of the central dogma of molecular biology. Uh, so just to help yourself, just try to redraw this diagram and think about what it means. So the idea is DNA can make other DNA through the process of replication, but DNA can also be transcribed to make RNA. RNA can, in some cases, be, um, uh, I, I, for lack of a better word, yeah, transcribed back into DNA, back into DNA. There are situations we have retroviruses that can insert themselves in the DNA. And there's also um, telomere synthesis that's actually done by a protein. So yeah, there is one situation where the DNA has um, something created by a protein, but that part of the DNA is not actually used for protein synthesis. So that's just a real subtlety here. But if you can recapitulate the diagram, you don't have to understand all the details yet, as we go through this lecture series, hopefully, hopefully it will be clear what this diagram actually means. But I don't think it's very difficult to recapitulate a diagram like this. And then we have RNA viruses. And RNAs can be made into proteins. So this is kind of a more modern, more comprehensive version of the central dogma of molecular biology. It, it takes all the kind of uh, special cases and, and lumps it in. But the idea, the most important point, as, as Levin stated, is the transfer of information into protein is irreversible. And you could see here there's only, the arrow goes only from RNA to protein. There's no arrow that goes back. So it, it, if we had the, uh, probably the most important point is that protein, the protein sequence can't be translated back into RNA and back into DNA. So what are we going to talk about in the molecular biology lecture series? We'll describe the following large molecules and cells and the major molecular processes, DNA, RNA, and protein. The making of DNA, which is through DNA replication, the making of RNA through transcription, the processing of RNA, and making of proteins, the process of translation. So now let's shift gears a little bit. We understand a little bit of what life is, tragically, uh, by accounting for the phenomenon of death. I don't mean to trivialize this, but that's just the way it is. We understand life um, somewhat by uh, the phenomenon of death. By the way, um, a large number of deaths, deaths are caused by accidents. You can see that highlighted in, in red here. And tragically, uh, uh, as I said, we understand what life means by the phenomenon of death. That is a picture of Princess Diana to um, about two months before she passed away. She was actually at a Red Cross function in Washington, D.C. She passed away in 1997 in a car accident. Very sad. 
So we understand uh, life has significance partly because of death. So why did I, why did we go into this subject? Well, when a creature dies, a lot of the, it has a lot of the same proportions of the right chemicals. So going, transitioning from the living state to the dead state, uh, at the moment something transitions to the, to the dead state, uh, the amount of DNA, RNA, and proteins, the proportion there is, is about the same. And so we have to think, well, is life mere chemistry and physics? That's a rhetorical question. Uh, what's important is the organization, the localization and positioning and state of the molecules, of the molecules. So let's just say for the sake of argument, life is mere chemistry and physics, but on top of that, uh, it has to have organization, localization, positioning and state of the molecules. So is, is, is life mere chemistry and physics? Uh, again, that is a rhetorical question. So, but what we can explore in molecular biology, what do the physical chemical natures of DNA RNA and proteins tell us about the nature of life. And what we mean by that is what happens if you don't have these things? What happens to life? What happens to life? Uh, I can almost guarantee that if you don't have proteins, there's no life. There are situations uh, with enucleated cells that don't have DNA, and you could say that those cells are alive, uh, but that's, uh, I'm getting way ahead of myself here but I, I, proteins are really, really important. So going back again to this question, what is molecular biology? It is the study of life at the molecular level, genes and their activities. <clears throat> In this molecular biology lecture series, we'll only look at the molecular aspects of cellular life. One way to understand life at the molecular level is by building it, synthesizing, cloning it. Really, we can only imagine building it rather than actually doing this in the lab uh, because that is extremely difficult. And as we'll find out, no one has ever done that despite Craig Ventner's claims um, to that effect. We can follow the steps at least conceptually. We'll also learn, um, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll also learn we can't actually at this time build a whole working cell from scratch. We have to use pre-existing parts of the cell to make a synthetic cell. Our technology has not advanced to the stage yet where we can take the raw elements of the periodic table <clears throat> and build life up one, build life up uh, one atom at a time. So that is, that's it. This was a pretty light lecture uh, as an introduction. And so that's the end of the technical part, um, the technical discussion in lecture one. Now, uh, in, the, uh, in the, next part, uh, uh, the next part of lecture one is going to be more of an administrative uh, details of what one might expect if one took this class in a college setting versus simply watching on YouTube or other recording. If one wants to learn um, the level of rigor at the college level, uh, you can either take the college course or try to do some of the following uh, that Dr. Tan uh, imposes on her students. So now I'll cover some of the uh, administrative things that one might expect in a real college course versus a YouTube course. That is perhaps one way to enhance your learning experience if you choose to try to do this to college level standards versus being just a casual viewer of this lecture series. The best way of learning is teaching. And in fact, that's what I'm doing uh, by presenting this lecture series. Um, even though I could watch it, I decided to recapitulate it, edit it, narrate it myself, uh, because I'm trying to learn molecular biology. I'm trying to master it. And this parallels the idea of trying to understand life by building it or more accurate, accurately conceptualizing some of the steps required to build life from scratch. Learning via teaching. 
uh, in the YouTube version, you grade yourself. Now, if you want to pay me to administer tests, maybe that can be arranged. In Dr. Tan's courses, she has the concept of flipped classes. And what that is, is that she'll teach two lectures herself and then have the students teach one lecture. It's called the flipped class exercise, learn via teaching. And I, I've, I've heard this, uh, there are other professors that uh, emphasize this and uh, I, I've heard varying levels of success in doing this uh, one way is it, it just it's it forces repetition and forces you to understand what you you're actually learning if you uh, if you can teach it you probably understand it so the purpose of uh, learn learning by via teaching is to digest to internalize and to apply knowledge. You'll also master molecular biology in a short time. So the idea is to save time. So what's the content? Uh, if you're a student and you're going <laughs> to present a lecture instead of the professor, you summarize what is taught in the lectures. You discuss what should have been taught in the lectures. And the format is a written presentation and then occasionally an oral presentation. And in Dr. Tan's class, it'd be printed due Friday each week. Uh, requires the title, your name, date, contents. It would look something like this. And if it's an oral presentation, wait, I made a mistake here, apologies. Uh, she, uh, Dr. Tan included this in her slides. I'm not too familiar what that is, apologies. So uh, if it's an oral presentation, you talk about what you write. Uh, it's 10 minutes and timed. Uh, if using PowerPoints, put on a flash drive. That's, again, if you're doing this in college. Uh, the grading for flipped exercises is 80% effort-based, 20% merit-based. The emphasis is on getting you to think about, criticize, interpret, and discuss scientific inf information without being intimidated about speaking up. And just an example of that, I actually modified Dr. Tan's original lectures and included cell theory. Now, why did I do that? One of her other books happened to have a big section on cell theory. And I said, well, this is not any different from anything else she taught elsewhere. So I figured I'd go ahead and include it. So that's me speaking up. And by the way, um, for those viewing this on YouTube, if there are technical errors in what I have, what we have presented in this YouTube video, please by all means comment and uh, that will be very valuable. So again, the contents in these flip lectures is what is taught in lectures, what you think should be taught in lectures. And again, the uh, oral presentation and written presentation, one to five pages uh, when you're not doing uh, an oral presentation. And as I mentioned earlier, in Dr. Tan's college course, you have two lectures by Dr. Tan and a flipped class per week where the students teach. Uh, the lectures are your most specific guide to what is important for this course. Never hesitate to ask questions to clarify what is said during the lectures. And this is the grading just to maybe uh, give you a feel for what it's like in the college environment. Uh, one, <laughs> 30 points is for participation. One point will be lowered for each unexcused missing class. Permission to be absent must be obtained before class. You don't have to worry about that in this video lecture series on, on places like YouTube. The flip class exercise is 60 points. Quizzes, 60 points and examinations, 50 points each. 
Um, so there's grading for participation, willingness to discuss questions, raising questions, answering questions, uh, be present, one point deducted every unexcused missing class, permission to be absent from class uh, needs to be obtained before class unless there's an emergency. Uh, there's grading for flip, uh, flip classes, again, 80% effort-based, 20% merit-based. And no surfing in class. The first offense, one point deducted for the, from the final grade. Ooh, so, ooh. So if you have 300 points, uh, you could, your first, the points is, your first offense is one point. Second offense, three points. Third offense, surfing, 10 points. Now, since this is the YouTube uh, video version of this lecture series, you can surf, I won't tell anyone, all right? No points will be deducted. Any questions? Uh, the, the material of this lecture series was gleaned mostly from Molecular Biology 4th Edition by Burton E. Tropp. And there are, uh, in Dr. Tan's course, it, uh, the course is administered via Canvas. Now, just some ancillary things. This is uh, Lefevre Pond, the wildlife pond in University of Missouri. That's a more modern picture. This is an older picture, and you could see the wooden bridge there, which the students called the kissing bridge. There's various life in the pond. And this leads to fossils at the University of Missouri. Uh, fossils are a window of past lives. And here's some examples of fossils. And at University of Missouri, and by the way, there's Lefevre right there, right here, if you could see it. Hopefully you could see there. So I presume the, the pond must be somewhere close. Anyway, there are lots of fossils throughout this area, throughout uh, this, this university is built on uh, a bed of a lot of fossils. So uh, it's called a mazooful of fossils. And those are some of the areas where there are fossils. In Dr. Tan's class, finding fossils will get you up to five points, one point for each nice and unique fossil found with with location and pictures. So if you get caught surfing, you can get yourself some fossils to make up for it. Also, editing writing textbooks. You get up to 20 points for helping in edit and write textbooks. Uh, and that textbook is uh, a textbook. That is Dr. Tan's textbook, which he's developing for the University of Missouri. I've been told that uh, the textbook is slated to be released and will be archived uh, at that university, perhaps among other places. So uh, we had the technical part of the lecture and then now this administrative part. So let's just wrap up. And I should point out, Dr. Tan says she has learned quite a, a lot from her students, both in the flip classes and also the feedback she's gotten in writing and editing uh, by them for her textbook, uh, which, I, as I mentioned earlier, is planned to be put in the public domain. So this is kind of open source, a collective effort. She's not going to make any money off of this. She's doing it as a labor of love to uh, <clears throat> help people learn molecular biology. So God bless her for that. The take home message. Again, if you're going to study molecular biology, one should know the um, the central dogma of molecular biology. So if nothing else, at least know the central dogma. Try to be able to, to at least uh, recapitulate this diagram, even if you can't understand all the details of it. And also, we can understand life by trying to build it, at least conceptually, um, conceptually uh, go through the steps of what it takes to build life. And uh, again, there are various statements of the, um, 
central dogma of, in, um, of molecular biology, the, the, watch in, the Watson version, which isn't precise, is that genetic information flows from DNA to RNA to protein. But the more precise one is in this diagram. So thank you for joining us in this first lecture of the college level molecular biology lecture series presented by the Evidence Reasons Academy. Take care.